Welcome to Rockstar Doctor Life. I'm Melissa Longo. As a chiropractor, I believe we have the profound ability to impact our communities and people's health on a global level, while also enjoying rich and rewarding personal lives and giving attention to the things that matter to us. Each week, you'll hear an inspiring conversation to give you ideas and insights to rock your practice, pursue your passions, find more connection and meaning in your life, and create a life and business that works for you. Hey there, listeners. This is another amazing conversation that you're going to get to hear with an amazing chiropractor, someone that I've had a great little pre-chat with, and someone who I'm excited to learn a little bit more from. Many of you will already know my guest today is Dr. Tracy Wilson. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. I'm excited to be here. So we've talked about a whole bunch of things in our little pre-chat, and I hope we're going to cover all of them in our conversation here today. But I always love to start with sort of a brief, like, what is Dr. Tracy Wilson doing these days? A brief introduction of yourself for our listeners. I am um, in private practice. Uh, I've been in private practice for 22 years, and um, we have, uh, as we defined our our role in our chiropractic community, not our chiropractic community, in our community, the, the vision through chiropractic is we... We saw one of the things we came up with was the five ways people destroy their wellness, which was uh, the lack of movement, the lack of eating the right foods, taking the right supplements, too much stress, and not enough chiropractic. And so we built uh, businesses and strategies and facilities to solve those problems. And um, we have a chiropractic office. We have a nutrition store with a cafe in it. We have a CrossFit gym. And um, they're all um, different buildings, different facilities. They're not necessarily all in one place. Um, I think that would be probably be the, the best idea that I could ever come up with down the road. But right now, it um, uh, we're all in different facilities. And so one day, maybe I can get them under one roof or not. And then um, we have an interest in buying and selling our properties. So we have a property company that, that uh, mainly is just an investment company. Um, then I get a chance to travel around, share with chiropractors, speak on different stages. And then um, we're launching out through that same speaking industry, um, kind of like you were for a while, the, the two towards models we've been. We've been talking to parents um, just about a, a re- really critical season in their kid's life and something that I became passionate about over the years. And um, so we've been we've been doing lots of stuff. Yeah, I have to say from a personal um, perspective here, I'm quite excited about that conversation because I knew the things you were doing as a chiropractor and you're speaking and professionally, but I didn't know that you had started to do this new, uh, the dad forge, you've called it. Why don't you start by telling us, I mean, how did that originate for you? I mean, I know you mentioned it started with conversations in your practice, but you're a father of five. And is this something that you've been working on since they were little or something that you started to see emerge as they got older? Well, I should ask you this. Is your is your audience PG? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's not. Sorry. You're free to swear if you need to. <laughs> well, you know, when I had my first daughter, she's 23 years old, um, I had a little kind of shit your pants moment. You know, I knew how I treated people growing up. But when she was born, you know, you look at that little infant, you look at how beautiful, how perfect, how wonderful. And as a chiropractor, I saw the, the vision of health. I saw the vision of all that. But as a but as a guy, man, I had instantaneous, holy crap, one day she's gonna date. And I don't know why it hit me when she was born, but it was it was a and, and I remember I had friends like, dude, that is years away. <clears throat> and so, but I said, I know, but but you know, if you're imprinting, if you're teaching, if you're if you're setting the example, like you can't wait till they're 15 and decide what to do. So I, I just began to really deeply think about like what what is this what does this look like for me to set the example for my daughter because if I'm her first hero and I'm the guy that she's going to set her standard by I better not screw this up and so we began strategy and I, and I'll give you just a couple of things that that I began to explain think about at the time um, I, I just thought about how I treated people I thought about how I treated girls growing up and I didn't like I didn't like that answer. Um, I had a good moral compass. I had a good family. I had parents that did it, but I didn't have anybody that sat me down and said, this is how you treat a girl. I mean, most of mine was trial and error. And I just realized that I had, if you talk to different people at different phases of my life, I wouldn't necessarily approve of the message that somebody might say about me based on that little season of my life. And so I just thought, man, there's got to be more to this. And over the years, I put myself, I, I probably studied parenting as much as I had studied chiropractic and maybe more. And then over the years, if I had patients that were successful in parenting, um, I'd have a conversation with them. I'd take them to lunch. I would, 
I would maybe schedule them to the last page of the day and ask if I could ask them a few questions. I'd interview them. And I just began to do it. If I had parents that had really crappy kids, I would, I'd do the same thing. I'd, I'd figure out what not to do. And, um, and over those years, I come up with these, these foundational principles and, and these, these foundational principles that were, were the simple things like reality discipline as well as this, that there's a reality to your, to your, to your, your decisions. Meaning a lot of parents, if you think about it, you want to rescue your kids. You want to save them. You want to help them. You want to do everything you can to make them avoid pain and only have pleasure. You want to create the best life in the world for them. But the best thing that your kids can do is understand that their decisions and their actions have consequences. And, you know, for us, this reality discipline was this process that, that we were going to set, you know, the idea that, that you know what's wrong. Then we had a conversation, meaning in our household, um, we gave spankings. But, but that was when you had lost respect. It wasn't when you inconvenienced us. It wasn't when you frustrated. It wasn't when you um, went down a bad path. It was when you created a lack of respect was warranting that side. Now, we had a process. We would always tell you, you know, we love you. We love everything you're doing. We love you as a person, and we just don't like how you're acting in this situation. And you know the consequence of it, so here's your SWAT, and then and then hug them after. And and it was a it was a process that we found uh, that there's a consequence. But the key is that the kids know what the consequence is, and we know that we have to follow through. And I see a lot of parents struggle with that. They they uh, you know like for example, when I first learned this, their mom was a counter. You know, one, two, and then the kids take off at three. And <laughs> I was an exaggerator. Um, I would say things like, if you do this, then I'm going to kick your butt to the moon. Well, how long did it take before they realized, number one, I'm never going to kick them. Number two, the moon's a long ways away. And so there's no reality to what I said. And so the, the, there's no guidelines that's going to really create this discipline. So when we tightened it up and we said, okay, no more three, it's one. We're going to tell you what we want. And then we're going to go to one. And if you don't go, you get a swat. And I'll never forget my middle one who's super analytical that it happened to her. You know, I said one and gave her a swat. And she looked back at me and she goes, but you didn't go to three. <laughs> and, and we told her, and we're not anymore. And so um, just begin to set the guidelines to say, here's what is expected, and then here's this, this process. And what we found is it creates a sense of responsibility. It creates, an adult, it creates a really valuable, you know, kid in the classroom. It, you know, and I just think it, it's as so we watch our kids grow through adulthood and get jobs and go through college, uh, that reality discipline has been the foundation. My daughter, who's in college, called me. Uh, about three months ago, and she said, this was all she called me to tell. She was, Dad, thanks for never giving me everything I wanted, but give me what I needed, even if it was discipline. Hmm. And um, I said, wow, what has stirred this? She said, I just have to tell you that I, I hang around kids that have, have never been told no. They've been inflated of this, this reality that is not real, and they are some of the most annoying, undisciplined, worthless people ever. And um, I realized that I got it because you didn't give me everything I wanted, but you gave me what I needed, even when it was discipline. And, um, and so she said, I just, just thank you. And so, you know, here's years later, she's 20 years old. And we started that process when she was two. And it just it's a long journey. I mean, if you have kids, you know this. And so mm -hmm. um, that's one of them. You know, um, another one that happens a lot that I think is valuable worth mentioning is parenting. And we can come back to this if we have questions. But one of them is this. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. And I have, I, have, I have gone back to that so many times, especially with my step kiddos, because you don't have that natural blood bond. And I started having rules before I had relationship, and it really started affecting it. They, weren't, they were starting to rebel. And I instantly knew that I needed, to, I needed to work on the relationship more than I needed to work on the rules. They had the rules. They needed the relationship. So, um, you know, I just started coming up with, all these great things, these foundational principles that led me to um, what we call the ultimate date, which we can talk about in a little bit. But, um, you know, foundational rules. It just started setting these things in place. And, um, you know, quality time does, you know, happens in the midst of quantity time. And you can't sit down and go, okay, I'm scheduling quality time with my kid. It, it doesn't happen. You know, for dads and moms that are out there that are, that are you know, awesome chiropractors, they're killing it in practice, they're crushing it in practice. You know, finding that balance to come home and spend, you know, enough quantity time with your children so that quality time can appear. Um, I, I don't know. There's no other, there's no shortcut around that. You just have to, you have to invest the time there. And, um, and so you get those little moments because it's, it's always those little moments, whether it be in the tub, 
or reading a book or you're putting them to bed or those little pitter patter feet in the morning. You know, I got up every Saturday morning and worked on my, my business plan and my, my week stuff, how the week went, what I was going to do the next week. But the one thing that I would shut everything down for is when I hear those little pitter patter feet across the tile <laughs> coming in and climbing your lap and they just want to hang out with you. So, you know, lots of little, I, I just came up with these things over the years that I, that I really stole from lots of great people. Uh, whether it be books or seminars or individuals. And um, and so we just started putting those together. And over time, people said, hey, man, these are awesome. you got to put these together and share them in some manuscript, call it a book. And so, you know, we've been working on it. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's um, it's something that is near and dear to all of our hearts as parents, right, is you want to do the best job that you can. And there's all these, as your children get older, I mean, my boys are only 12 and 16, you encounter new new issues with them. And, and they're not even issues sometimes, but they're just new challenges that you need to work through and, and how are we going to best guide them through those challenges that they're going through or even if there's not a challenge it's how can i best support you through this knowing everything that i know as an adult so that you don't make the mistakes that i make but at the same time you need to make some mistakes because that's how you're going to grow and learn through them anyway and when you don't like you said your daughter said when you don't get everything that you want you know that there's consequences to your behavior yeah and you know, let's go there because i think that's important like like you know, there's stages, and, and we, we have identified three stages. And chiropractors, we know these stages. We, we talk about them. We see them in practice. We even, some, if you if you got a pediatric practice, you quote about them. You know, kids are plastic minds until they're age of 12, right? And so, you know, there's a book out there called Kids Are Wet Semen, and it talks about that, that, that up until the age of 12, how moldable their brain is. And after the age of 12, it just becomes like those ruts in concrete that, man, it's hard to change at that point. And, um, you know, I always say there's, it, it, it's, it's the reptilian, the midbrain, and the forebrain. And that reptilian brain is the fight or flight. It's, it's the one that, you know, it's like two kids. You take their toy, they're going to take it back. You know, they're going to fight over it. And, and that's just it's, just, it's just like toddler playground, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at 12, you don't see that anymore. But what you see is you start to see, and, and if any parent, and, and <laughs> you may have asked this, Melissa. You, you, you have probably asked your kids this if you've been a parent of two kids. Um, do you ever care about anybody but yourself? Right? <laughs> yeah. And the reason that we ask this is because they're in the midbrain, which is it's it's all about them. It's it's the it's the process, it's the time frame that they learn about them. And you know, it's a time frame that if we're not careful, you know, we lie to our kids. We don't mean to, you know, we tell them there's a Santa Claus and they're little, and then we tell them that they're cute when they're in that little awkward phase and they're not. Um, and and we try to help with this this esteem idea, but they're really building that esteem in those critical years of me. But, but man, they can't think about anybody but themselves. And, um, you know, they, they look around, and here's what's, here's what's most, so important for parents. They look around, and they're looking at the examples around them. And here's the thing. They're watching us to see how we exemplify how to care for others. And, and so if we're not portraying this fact of servanthood in our own life, they can't drive that to the forebrain because forebrain's all about others. How do we care about others? And that doesn't develop until 25 in boys. So you get these this 22 to 25 year old range that this frontal lobe develops where we can actually learn and actually care about other people. But from about somewhere between 12 and 13, 14, and then all the way up to about 18 to 22, you get this midbrain dominance that, that literally they think solely about themselves. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a neat phase, but it's, I think it's important to know that this teenage phase is where they're going to drive us the craziest because, you know, you'll tell them one thing and they're literally just, it's like when one ear out the other, people go, did you not hear me say clean your room? And they're going to go, huh? You know, and they, they were standing there in front of you two seconds ago and you said it. <laughs> uh, and so it's just, you know, as parents, we, we, it's not a time to battle, but to understand they're in a mid-brain experience, pick your battles wisely. And then really understand, like, like they're developing. And it's for me to show them how to care for others, and to literally take them, like, take them to, take them to, you know, an elderly home and serve others. Literally, don't just go on Thanksgiving and don't just go on Christmas. Don't go on the two holidays to go serve others, but literally put it into your life where you can go physically show them how to care for others is the only way to drive a frontal lobe experience. 
Mm -hmm. And I think for me, um, and I've spent some time learning about that recently because I said, by, you know, you have these little people and then they grow into teenagers and you're like, I don't really understand you right now. <laughs> but the more I've understood what you were just sharing, like the, the neurology and how their brain is growing and how the brain functions are so completely different. It has really empowered me to parent my boys differently because I understand their brain is not capable of certain things at this stage. And so it's helped me ease off in some expectations and helped me, as you said, nurture different um, needs that they have and just understand them differently and not, you know, they need a lot of sleep, for example. Their, their cycles are different. There's all these different pieces of their brain that it, just like, you know, we do with our patients, if we understand how the body is working, it can then help us understand what they need to support. Well, you know, the communication changes, the, as you said, the you know, they're little, you can tell them that, hey, if you grew your kids up and you said that vertical stripes are horizontal and horizontal stripes are vertical, and you, you taught your kids that up until the age of school, they would go to school and argue for you because that they're not going to do it. But all of a sudden, the midbrain experience, the difference is they got to test what you said. And let me give you an example. You've told your kids, I love, you know, we've all at some point told our kids, I love you and there's nothing you can do to affect my life. Like at some point, we <laughs> express that. They're going to test it. They're yeah. going to find out the edge of that. And they're, they're like, hey, mom said this, right? Did she really mean this? And and what happens is, is that we, we have to remember, like, and I'll, I'll give you an example. My, my oldest daughter had no trouble in, in a prom her senior year, like never been the principal, never got in trouble, never had anything wrong. She decided with 40 of her best friends to drink a prom. And they got busted. And so I had to go up and get her. And they called. And as I was heading up there, I went through three stages. I was first angry. And I was angry because I was I was embarrassed. And then as I worked through that and realized it's not about me, I was sad. And I was sad for her. And then I got really grateful because it was a principal calling and not a sheriff telling me that she splat on the side of the road. That a principal had done their job and they caught her in this overwhelming gratitude and tears of joy. Not because she was caught, but because I was grateful that it wasn't a, a, an officer calling me to come identify my kid in, the, in a car wreck. But it was this. And as I got there, I was I was gone through these three stages, and I realized how many parents never get through phase one. They're just embarrassed and angry. And as, as I picked her up... Um, and they make it about them, right? It's about all of a sudden you're embarrassing me or you're disappointing yeah. me, and this is all about us and our expectations or what the public sees of us. But really, uh, I want to let you finish there, but it's not about that. It's about their experience. 100%. And, and you know what? Every one of those become teaching events. And so... Mm -hmm. You know, and my daughter was really interesting. Is she called me? She would not call her mom. She called me. She wanted to talk to me. She said, "Dad, I know you're going to handle this right. You always told me that I'll handle this well." And mom's just going to freak out. And so um, it was an interesting thing for our lives because we had set these principles down, but they, you know they don't consciously think about it, but they're going to test them. Um, it's how they develop their brain. It's how they have to find out is really what you told me true. Um, did you really say you love me that much? Did you really say that this would hurt me? Did you really say that? And that's just the phase that they're in. I mean, if you think back to your own teenage, Bill, I mean, my gosh, how many things that we all tested. Um, <laughs> I've literally done what your daughter did with my parents, but like the last couple of years, I've called my parents and watching my own son grow up, I've said to my mom, I'm sorry for anything that yeah. I did for just, four years of my life because I get it now. <laughs> Yeah, you just send flowers. And she's like, why don't you send flowers? Don't worry about it. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, just send you flowers because I, I know that I screwed up your life big time when I was in high school. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting phase. Yeah. And I love that you shared um, also the, the concept of, you know, they go through these phases when they're younger too, right? Because so many parents that I speak with, uh, you know, they're in those phases of the, when their kids are little, they're infants and toddlers in their school age years. And, and those are busy years, right? They're all busy in different ways. But when you're the demands, especially for women, when you're breastfeeding and, you know, you're parenting them so intensively and maybe you're taking time out of your business and your practice to be there, it totally adds up to an amazing experience for them when they're older because you are laying that foundation of, of love and attention and relationship, as you said, in connection with your children before they hit 12 and then their brains start to change. And, you know, you can, I often remind parents like you can't see the effects of what you're doing now. You can't see the effects of this time you're investing with your child, but it will pay off later down the road. Right. Well, you know, and I, I can simplify this and this, this, this may be a little bit controversy for the, for the, some of the listeners, but I think they'll, they'll find value in it. I found a principle that, that really resonated with me and I, and I have stuck hard to this. And um, hopefully the listeners will find it find it as, as, as rewarding. I had, you know, as, as, a, as a dad to a daughter, 
So if you take it, if you have a daughter or you have a son, let's look at this. A daughter's, a dad's role to his daughter is to love her unconditionally so she can find that in the world. A mother's role is to show her how to be a female, show her how to be a girl because she's the only one that can. Like she's, she has the part, she has the mood, she has the hormones, she has it all. And, and so we focus really hard on, let me just, I, I get the opportunity as a dad to my daughter to love that girl unconditionally. It doesn't mean that I don't hold her accountable. It doesn't mean that we don't, I'm still not a dad. It's just, I get a chance to love her unconditionally. And then, and then the girl's mom really had a chance to show them how to be a little lady. Now, vice versa, the dad's role to his son is to show that, that boy how to be a man and, um, and do that hard. And it doesn't mean that um, it's hardship and no love, but that mom gets a chance to love that boy unconditionally so he can find that love in the world and he can recognize when he sees it. Now, that's extreme, obviously. We, 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 didn't, we didn't make it perfect on that. We screwed that up a lot of times, but that was always the outcome, the goal. Mm -hmm. And so when my girls were young, I dated my girls, you know, not, not, not in a, we're going to piss off some listeners here, you ready? Not, <laughs> not, okay. not in an Arkansas dating way, right? Yeah. So for all you Arkansas listeners, you can send a message to the show, that's my fault. But uh, the, uh, we, not, not in the sick you know, way, but I'm talking like. You invested time set, with them, yeah. I want to set an example. I mean, I'm talking like go home, mom would get them dolled up. I would go in. I would pick out some music that I knew they liked that I never liked the Disney, whatever the crap it was, right? I, I didn't love the music, but I knew she loved the music. So I would put it on the iPod. I'd get it all set up. I'd get it cute. I'd plan the day. I'd go home, change my clothes, get freshened up. I'd pick her up, open the door for her, get her in the car, take her to the dinner, take her to ice cream. Take her bowling. Take her. Take her on a date. And sometimes it was to the park to feed the ducks. Sometimes it was to dinner and a movie. But I, I have, we have regularly dated our daughters from the age of the age of two and a half on. And this is one on one time that you break away and you go one on one and you just you talk life. You talk, you know, you talk whatever you can. But it's just you say I'm taking time to do this. And you know that's hard. That is so hard with life and everything that's going on. But man, we, we invested that time, and um, it has it has paid off monumentally. Um, we're also teaching side, them how they want how they deserve to be treated. Absolutely, mm -hmm. because it, and the same thing for the mom. You know, the moms take the boys on the dates because if this is how you. And there's so many times we talk about this is how you treat somebody. This is, you know, these are just some ways that we think you know the family values that we've grown up with, and we want to impart to them. This is the way that you do it. You just do it through time. And, um, so sometimes the dates had a lot of plans. Sometimes they didn't, but it, um, it led, it led us to, um, having an incredible relationship, which again, solved the idea that if I had rules, but as long as my relationship was there, there was, the rebellion was dramatically down. Mm -hmm. Well, that's already been tremendously valuable for me and listeners, there will be links to, uh, you know, these work that, Dr. Tracy is doing so you can find out more about the dad forge and learn more about his approach and, and get on his list and, and learn from his courses there um, but let's talk a bit about chiropractic now because you've been in practice for 20, 20 years over 20 years and you're speaking and you're teaching and you've run multiple practices so take us on that journey I mean, did you always envision having multiple practices and being being your own boss or did you ever work as an associate or as an independent contract or locum anything like that yeah, so I started out with a wonderful one, one of my uh, my mentor, which I have a picture to the right of my desk. Um, I have my board of directors, as I'm sure a lot of people do. Just I have pictures of the people that are mentors in my life to the right of my desk, and uh, Doctor Ashley's one of them. And he was he'd been in practice 40 years. I had the opportunity to go into practice with him, and the idea was for me to take over and buy out. Um, it didn't work out in the long run. Long, long story short, uh, his wife got cancer. He got sick. He got remarried, new wife changed rules. I mean, life just turned. And mm -hmm. so it went down the street and I started a practice. And I always knew I wanted to be a cash practice. I never wanted to deal with insurance. Um, I, I don't know why. Um, I think that I, I, I'm not a very analytical person. I'm not a, a side of real of details frustrate the heck out of me. Um, that's why I probably the writing the book so dang hard for me. Uh, <laughs> that's why you have to have people but, who help you do that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, early in practice, I just knew that I needed to avoid things that had a lot of details. And I just, I would really, I was really good at adjusting. I was really good at talking with people. 
and I had a passion to serve. And, and so I just needed to be able to say, you know, your adjustment at the time, it was $37 at the time. I, actually, when I started, it was $27. And then, you know, it's, it's, kind of, it's changed quite a bit over the years. Um, but that that was the process of, you know, starting out and just telling people, this is what you need and this is how we're going to do it. And I, I never I never knew anything else. When people would tell me that the chaos they were going through in the cash and in the insurance world, I, I literally would shake my head like, your guys are crazy for even attempting this. Um, you know, why can't you just tell them what they need and, and here's what your fee is going to be and turn around and, and just deliver the goods. And uh, so we did that. And over the years, you know, you do something well and people want to know about it. So I, I started traveling, speaking and sharing. And my first stage was Parker uh, College of Chiropractic at the time. It's now Parker University. Um, and um, I, I, I got a call from um, Jim Parker, actually, when I got out of school. And I had a first year of huge success. And, and I got a newspaper article written about me. And um, it got shipped to him somehow. And so he invited me back to speak at what's called the Parker Assembly, which is speaking to the, the, you know, back to students that are in school and saying, hey, you've been out for a year. You've been kicking butt, taking names. Tell these students how you did it. And, um, and so after the deal, he said, you know, you need to apply to be on our Parker team. He said, you have a gift. And I, I, I never had done that. Although, although I will say this, when I was, when I was a little kid, there was, I used to get, you know, like any kid get in trouble and I'd climb up my house, this little ledge, I'd climb out my window and there was a little ledge in my, and the reason I do it because no one would find me there, but I could look out over the west, western uh, sky and I would just sit and imagine and I'd close my eyes, a lot of times in frustration, my brother or my parents or whatever. And, um, and I would see myself on a stage talking to groups of people and as a little little kid i had no idea what this meant and years later that that vision i saw happened at parker um i was standing in front of a room i had two thousand people mm -hmm. in the room um i was speaking on cash practice and um and it was as clear as day that that vision i had as a kid was i was living in that moment and um so i don't know what god had in mind for me back then but it was, um, I, I'm sure I'm glad, and I'm sure I'm glad that I just, I just said yes, and I didn't, uh, I didn't debate or, you know, whine or argue. It, I've had, a, I've had a blast at the time. So over the last 17 years, I've spoke on lots and lots of different platforms and uh, traveled all over this world um, sharing a message. And your practice now, you've gone from having, I mean, how did, I, I meant to scratch my head thinking, how, how did you do that? Because you have, your oldest daughter is 23, so you had children very close to yeah. when you started practice and you're juggling a full-time busy practice with a growing family and speaking. So did you have any specific rituals or productivity? There are things that helped you during those busy years when you were doing a lot. I'm not saying you're not busy now, but in those early years, because you, obviously you have a really strong relationship with your kids and listeners might be feeling like, okay, how do I do the same thing? You know, Yes, I did. I, I, I've always been a morning routine person. Um, I've always got up and I've, I've, I've envisioned an outcome and worked from an outcome, not where I'm at. I've always fighted, you know, fought, fought, it, fought in my head uh, to not look at where I'm at, but look at where I want to go and keep that vision solid in my head. And, um, and if that vision doesn't scare you, um, you probably can't call it a vision. And, and the reality of it is it's never the how. I think we all get stuck in the tyranny of how we're going to do something, um, but it's 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 the why you're going to do something that's so important. And I and I I've always had such a big why, and um, it's a story that I share all the time, and I'll share it here. My why is my oldest daughter. When I was in chiropractic school. We were we were trucking along, and she was born. Um, traditional medical hospital. There was no Epic Pediatrics. There was no ICPA certifications. There was none of these. There's none of that. And in fact, we were told. Um, to get children checked if they need it, maybe you should. If not, you should take them to the medical doctor and see what happens. I mean, there was no, there was no stuff like there is now. There was not the passionate side of this that was where we see it today. And um, she was born and pulled out, and immediately was put in ICU. And for nine days, we sat in ICU. And she was diagnosed with sleep apnea, which means every time she goes to sleep, she stopped breathing. And and I was at Tri Four. Dr. Michael Hall was my neuro teacher. And, um, I've shared the story with him. He's a dear friend now. Um, we've got to share the platform many a times and, and, uh, message back and forth on a regular basis to speak. Anyway, I love him like a brother and, and I owe so much to him. And, um, it's amazing because I, for whatever reason, he was in my path one day and I said, 
Dr. Hall, if anything in the neurology is anything about the subluxation can cause this. And he looks at me and he said, absolutely. And he just starts rattling off all these neurological pathways and stuff. And I was like, wait a second, wait a second, hang on a second. <laughs> Say that again. And so we started, um, he, he shared again, I recorded it, I memorized it on the way back to the hospital, I shared it with the doctor. I walked in and I, 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 I threw up this information on him and I prayed to God he didn't ask me questions. And, um, and he said, you know, that's how it's supposed to work, but it's not what we make happen. We just, all we can give is drugs. And that was day eight. And it was that night we made the decision that we were checking her out and we had to sign basically our lives, her life away and check her out on a monitor and take her to a pediatric chiropractor. And, um, and I didn't give her her first adjustment. I took her to somebody that, that adjusted her, her sphenoid and her atlas and her occiput. And she was on a monitor, and the monitor normalized uh, while sitting in front of us. Hmm. And, um, and I knew at that point, it was my defining moment. It was my, um, it was my moment where I just I felt like, I felt like it was, if, you, if inspiration is the breath within us, and if, if, if enthusiasm is the God within us, it was an inspiration of enthusiasm that, that has never left me. And it was a, it was a moment where I just said, this is my path. And um, I, I, I sat on that and I said, my gosh, this is a chiropractic thing. It's about life and death. This isn't about neck and back pain. This is about telling the truth. And I just chose, and I think this is probably my greatest strategy. I just chose to always tell the truth. And I'm not talking about, you know, being ethical in practice, although I think it's massively important. I'm talking about that if someone has a subluxation, tell them what it's going to do to their life, not about neck or back pain. And, you know, that that has been the standalone thing that we've been able to do in our life. And then, you know, of course, the ability, I think, chiropractors to, to know what to adjust. And this is a bit of a technique. It's hard to do on a podcast, but it's worth mentioning. I think it's know what to adjust and know when it, and, and you know they're clear. And if you don't know that and you're just moving high spots and you're talking about, you know, the football games, the soccer games, the World Cup, the Tour de France, and you're just pushing down, mashing down high spots, I, I, I just don't think that you're leaving room for N8 to guide you to the, to the number one subject station that's going to release that body, that's going to ma it's maximize the healing so that that person literally will feel something in their body that they've never felt before. And when that happens, um, people cannot resist to refer to you. They just can't. They they said, I've, I've never experienced what I've experienced here. Um, and they go tell everybody. And so we've been a referral practice. Um, this year has been the first year that we have just chose to use Facebook as an advertising platform for some, some uh, events we do. Uh, it's worked fantastically, but uh, we've never advertised. We've, 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 for all these years, have sat down and just been a referral practice. And and I'm always shocked when somebody is struggling in practice because when I look at this, I drive to school. I mean, I drive to work and I pass the school. I see a school for children. I see a school that, you know, on average is given 220 medications a day with a, with a class of 400. I see all those parents confused about what creates health. And I see so many that are literally sick and dying waiting to find me. And all I have to do is put my message in front of me. That's all I have to do. And and we will never, ever, ever have a lack of new patients. And we never have. If anything, we've had a lack of, of people to, to be able to handle that. So when we've had multiple, multiple practices or we've dropped down to one, um, it has never been because we're unsuccessful. It's been by conscious choice of where we're at in the season of our life or, or, or whatnot and how that may be. But it's always been because I've just told people the message. And, and um, I, I think chiropractors will just get over it. The only reason I find chiropractors don't do this is they have to get over themselves. Hmm. Um, the, you know, when I worry about what someone thinks about me, I will miss it. And, and Dave Jackson, a dear dear to mine, um, amazing program, Epic Practice. And he, he, Dave, Dave and I have been buddies uh, as long as I can remember. I mean, maybe maybe 17 of these 22 years, we've been really good friends. And we we met on the CLA circuit years ago and, and just became kindred souls with daughters. And his was a little older than mine, but three daughters. And, um, and, and he, he was given a talk one time and he said a quote, and I, and I never forgot it because it, it, it charges me. And it's Voltaire. And Voltaire said, 
The deepest, darkest places in hell are reserved for those who know and do not tell. And if you, I don't, I don't know what Voltaire was talking about, but if I apply that to chiropractic, um, I don't ever want to meet somebody that I don't tell the truth to. Mm -hmm. It's a lot lot of power, a lot of powerful uh, ideas you just shared there. I love it. So I I think if a chiropractor can just over, not just, not just, because that's a, that's a demoralizing word. If they could overcome their worry about what people think about them, about their worry of public speaking, about their worry of certainty, and just get an idea of what chiropractic is, understand the truth of what it is that, that when they you know, it's as simple as this. If there's a, if there is a subluxation in the body, putting pressure on the nervous system, altering the way that nervous system expresses, then there's going to be a lack of function in that body on the front part or back part of that nervous system, which means the organic system or the skeletal system, right? And there's going to be a process that they may have symptoms, they may not have symptoms. We use the CLA scan technology uh, where we can measure the scan before and after so we know when the subluxation is clearing. Uh, no guesswork, no symptom talk, no, hey, how's that or How's that neck feeling? Sure, they will talk about it. Sure, they do. Um, is it where I stay? No way. I, I, I want to take them to where I want to take them, which is a strategy of your life is better with us in it. Um, you know, we have a few quotes around our office. Your life is better when you're in it. You know, healthy babies, healthy, happy mamas. And we just know that if we can get, um, if we can get people in the process of what we're up to, um, we have 14 education pieces. And those education pieces, um, I'll tell you what, I, I will be glad to share this with your listeners. I will send you a PDF file with my 14 things people can make it their own, however they want to do it. But I discovered 14 things that I've rewritten uh, over the years that if people, it's the old saying, if they know what I know, they'll do what I do, right? And um, so we have, you know, I, I realize that in the first 12 to 14 visits, if people can understand these concepts, they get a sheet, we talk about it on their visit. That's our tip. That's our moment of them. We'll talk about that in the first little bit. They're never, we're not trying to make them the chiropractors, we're trying to make them into great chiropractic patients. In fact, we want to make them the chiropractic warriors. Where they go to bat for us, protect us, fight for us, argue for us, uh, refer to us. And when people get the idea about that, they feel empowered to help you, um, you know, expand your vision. So you've talked about having, at one point, seven different practices and then simplifying it all. What drew, what, what was the push for that, that change in your life and your business? Oh, man. So, you know, like anything, chiropractors and, and and, and I'll, I'll say this in a, in a, in a couple modes. Um, you know, we were succeeding at high levels. And so we were attracting a lot of people who would have come alongside of us and, and join in. Um, and the mistake I made is I wasn't prepared to let go of some of the practice stuff and become more of the CEO stuff. Um, had I done that, I think I could have kept everything together and, and I could still have some amazing partners and we could have, we could have probably more of the strongest uh, businesses ever in the West Texas uh, strategy. Um, those those people that were with our practice, if you go in our town and you see, um, you know, seven of the top chiropractors in this town, five of them, the names that consistently show up, um, were nurtured in our world. Um, and I and I love that. I, I love the fact that it's, it's a bit like a proud dad, even though there's probably only a couple of them that would admit that that was a big part of their life. Um, you know, because sometimes it ends well, sometimes it doesn't. But, the, but, but each one of them have shared with me that it was an epic part of their life to, to make that step. And so we grew this up, and I just, I just didn't, I don't know, you know, I just didn't understand that I needed to branch away from the chiropractic side, and I needed to go into the, um, you know, the management side. And so what happened is, is I just, I was burning both tails at both ends. I had tons and tons of risk on the table. I had very little gain, and I had a whole lot of risk. And... Um, and I just hit a point where I, I was I was stressed beyond belief, and I, I had decided to make a decision that, that this wasn't what I signed up for. I I had in my mind what it was going to create, and so uh, in fact I, I I was talking to another guy who was doing some coaching at the time, and he said, you know, you attract a lot of the problems in your life that, you, that you're that you're passing out to people, and so. I realized that here I was complaining about these things going on in our, in our practices, and the reality was I was attracting them right back into my life. And so um, I just made the decision to say, you know what, 
I, I, I've grown. We had five business, seven locations, 20 employees. We were rocking and rolling, massage therapists to, to acupuncturists to um, support staff. I mean, we, we had some big operations from South Texas all the way up. And, um, and, it, and I, just, I just had to say enough's enough. And so I just sat down and I, I sold out. Um, I let people go. I, and I downsized to what I knew that I loved the most, which was just helping people. And so I went back to a one doctor office uh, with two CAs, and um, we were extremely busy. And I and I've always worked with people, so my freedoms went away a little bit. And I had to prove to myself like just a few things that I thought, well, you could never take a day off. Well, yeah, I found out. I took some time off, and I we still met our goals. And I thought, well, that's a bunch of hogwash, bullcrap thinking. And so <laughs> over about three, I, I spent about so I, here's what I did. I spent about a year pouting. Okay, truthfully, I spent about a year pouting. <laughs> And I was pouting because I, I didn't do what I thought I was going to do. And then I spent a year strategizing and thinking and contemplating and kind of dealing with my pouting and thinking like, okay, what's good out of this? And then I started spending a year going, okay, if this is what's good out of it, what do I really, really want? What do I, I mean, if I sat down, what is it that I really want? And I, and I went outside. I mean, I hired a Tony Robbins coach. I, I really went deep with this. I really, really said what I want. I dug deep, deep, deep into this. And when I discovered what I want, I came out. And we have hit, um, and I can tell you this, the, the clarity that has come out of that. Um, our practice has had record months for the last six months, um, almost every month. And we have, we have finally clarified our vision, and we've, now that we're building it, we're thinking different, we're hiring different, we're, we're building our team differently. Um, I'm coming at it from a more CEO mindset than I'm coming at it from just a chiropractor trying to help chiropractors, um, you know, come on in and get busy kind of thing. And, um, and so I, that's what's different. That's a lot of a lot of uh, honesty there, which I really appreciate because I know a lot of docs listening. Uh, you know, we all aspire to different things in our life. And actually, just uh, before this interview today, I did a diff different other interview, and we ended up talking about this as well. That sometimes people get focused on on all these things and and stuff that they think they're supposed to want, and they chase it. And I know, not saying suggesting this is what happened for you, but it's it's the point is like you chase the wrong things until you step back and go, why am I not happy? I have all these things. But without stepping back to look at, well, what do I really want? What do I really love to do? You could be chasing the wrong things. Well, and I, and I think that's correct. I mean, even if for an office, I mean, the, the natural step for a successful office is to hire somebody. It's a natural step. Um, hire an associate. And, and, and I can tell you that can be one of the most freeing and it can be one of the most frustrating processes. And here's what I've learned. There's two things that are responsible. Number one, um, when you hire an associate, it is fair for that, for you guys to think deeply and clearly about what those roles are. Um, like now, you know, when we hire, we're, we're bringing a guy in in the next couple months, and, and we have thought down, and, and here's, the, here's the question I ask. What are you really good at, and what do you really want to do? And, and it's amazing that he had trouble answering that question. And I said, think about it. Text me. But you've got to come up with that answer, because when I make your job role, I want you to come in every day. And just be freaking pumped you get to do this. So if that's that you just want to put your hands on as many people as possible, and that's what you want to do, and you just want to be a badass adjuster, and you want to, you know, if, you, if I put 100 people on your schedule, you're going to go home, and at the end of that day, you're going to be like, Ooh, man, I love what I do. You know what I mean? Like, if that's, if that's your thing, then let's set it up that way. But if your thing is, I love relationships, I love I love nurturing and fostering relationships. I want to be the retention expert. I want to do every re-exam. I want to sit and have those, those 15, 20-minute conversations with people about where they were and where they're going and what the next goals are. And I want to spend my day nurturing relationships and creating events and creating inside strategies and doing everything I can to retain all the people that we have. Then let's do that. But let's not try to make you everything in the practice. If your gift is to, like my gift is to go out and speak, so the guy that I have now, I don't make him even think he has to go out and speak and find new patients. That's never the good strategy because it's not his gift. Mm -hmm. And so my gift is to go out and do that. So I set up the events. He supports the events. He will he will stay late. He'll get up early. He'll do whatever it takes to, to get it ready. And then and then I get up and get to deliver. And so I walk in last minute. My team has everything set up. And, and I walk in, cross the speech. They, they carry all the support to, to what happens. They answer a lot of the questions. I, I stay around and help, but they then 
process, and then he loves taking on those new patients and taking them in and getting them into care. He loves that report process. That's one of the things he loves. And so you know what? We for, we found the strategy, and so the strategy is really, if I can keep people more in their loves, and and then reward them for being there. And I think that's the second reason people people often struggle is they, they just get little cheap asses and they don't want to reward people. And um, and I've been there, right? I've mm-hmm. been there counting my pennies too much. And um, and so we do our best to reward people, but still run a business. I mean, I, I'm very very open about where we are in this to make a profit. And we are going to help people, but we're going to be a profitable. And you're going to make a profit. And I'm going to make a profit. And there's no stupid games going on. You're going. To, I'm going to be as transparent as I can be um, with the business. And and I want you to understand where I'm coming from. I want you to understand where you're coming from, so that you love to be here. Um, and of course, I mean it's the same thing with your whole team. If they, you know, my team, I, I tell them, you get a chance to prove to me every day why I can't live without you. And 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 if, and if I do that, let me tell you something. I'll pay. I'll I'll pay to the end of the day if you keep showing me that. But if, if our numbers are low, our retention's low, or, or no one's signing and no one's collecting and you keep causing the problems, you're always late, uh, all those things, then you give me no reason to keep you around. I'll find somebody who wants to do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're just a little bit more transparent with our expectations and our loves. And, and I think that I think that's the difference that we, we're going at this time. Mm-hmm. Has your definition of... Um... I mean, obviously, yeah, we want, everyone wants to be profitable, but has your definition of success for you as Tracy changed over your years in practice and, you know, as your children have gotten older as well? Absolutely. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I probably not given that definition a lot of, um, credence in my life. Um, my, my statement probably is fulfillment. Um, you know, profitability is, is what's left at the end of the day. And that means, you know, if, if I, if I get home and I'm drained and I can't give anything to my family, I'm not very profitable, no matter how much money is in my account. Um, if I get home at the end of the day and there's no money in my account and I have to look at my family in the face and say, we, you know, what we can and can't do because I, I sucked at being a car broker, um, there's no profitability in my life. So it's the balance of the fulfillment of me doing exactly what I said to others. I want to do what I love to do all day. And, and that is build up people, um, build a team, and see, see patients and make a difference. But I've taken on the role that, that, listen, I used to get a lot of frustration about, you know, why can't my team get this? And the reality of it is, you know why? If they could get it, they'd own it. And so they need me as much as anything. So when I come in on Wednesday mornings, I, I focus my Wednesday mornings, which is our training, um, it's my time to pour into them to make them better. I got to pour into them so they can pour out to our people. And, and so I can't pour out if, if I'm not pouring into myself, which again, starts in the morning. I get up, um, I listen to YouTube, I listen to podcasts, I listen to, um, I'm excited to learn a lot more about yours because I got another podcast. To to. I, I, <laughs> I was just going to say, well, now you've got another yeah. podcast you can listen yeah. to. Yeah, you're right. You're darn right, man. I, I, I love it because I, 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 I got to get, I got to fill up so that I can pour out. And um, I think a lot of chiropractors, they're struggling there. And um, and there's a lot of reasons they're struggling there. I mean, and, and we don't have time to get into it, but mm-hmm. I'll just say this for our listeners. It's, it's the same thing when I said get over yourself. Many chiropractors are carrying too much baggage in their life. They don't, they, there's, there's something they did wrong and they had forgiven themselves. There's somebody that's hurt them and they have forgiven it. They've been through a bad associate and they're still freaking whining about it. You know what? Set your shit down. And move on. Like I, I made a post the other day. You can't grab hold of the future by hanging on to the past. Your hands are full. There's yeah. a moment you got to set that crap down. Choose. It's not. It's not a feeling. It's not timing. It's not. It's, it takes a year. Bullshit. Put it down. And and make some steps forward. Mm-hmm. Choose it. Mm-hmm. It's a choice. Well, I can certainly see why your name was brought to my attention several times as amazing people I needed to have a conversation with because we are way over time and I know there's lots of things we could still chat about and I've thoroughly enjoyed this and learned quite a few things myself today already. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for being here today. If you like this show, please share it with another chiropractor and connect them with this message. We are always better off together than we are alone. 
If you haven't yet subscribed, head on over to Apple Podcasts or iTunes, and don't forget to rate and review the show while you're there. Be sure to connect with me on Instagram and Facebook, and find out more about today's guests and all things Rockstar Doctor Life by clicking in those show notes. See you next time.